was most pronounced in neighborhoods with the lowest self response rates to the 2020 census, suggesting that not enough resources were invested in field operations to complete the count. As Mayor Duggan explained in his testimony, in the attached statements from 11 census workers support, the field operation in Detroit started late, ended prematurely, and was inadequately staffed and supervised. Our research also revealed that the 2020 census substantially undercounted the number of occupied housing units in 10 block groups that we compared, where we compared the census housing data to data from the U.S. Postal Service and a door-to-door -door canvas. We estimated that the 2020 census undercounted the population in these areas by 8%. If undercounts of a similar magnitude exist in a majority of the city's more than 600 block groups, the ultimate size of a population undercount could be in the tens of thousands. The Samuel Census is a massive and complex operation. Although I've been critical of the 2020 census for undercounting Detroit's population and residential housing stock, I also want to acknowledge the severe and unprecedented operational challenges that the Census Bureau faced and commend the Bureau for its heroic efforts in adapting to extremely difficult circumstances created by budget concerns and the pandemic. But as the panel to evaluate the quality of the 2020 census at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine recently concluded, there are well-founded concerns about the 2020 census that need to be investigated. As the mayor noted in his testimony, for Detroit, a principal concern is that between 2019 and 2020, the Census Bureau appears to have dropped over 58,000 addresses from its master address file. Based on our research, this seismic decline in housing stock is likely inaccurate and translates into a significant population undercount. There's a real human impact behind this undercount. Millions of people that should have gotten millions of dollars that should have gone to programs providing affordable housing, nutrition assistance, early childhood education, and more won't reach the people who need them. Entire communities may be underrepresented in Congress and state legislatures because of lost seats. This is exactly why local governments, including Detroit, should be empowered to not only question, but also challenge the accuracy of the housing and population counts in their jurisdictions. But as of now, the data, we, the data needed to decisively show an undercount are hidden from these localities. Without the master address file and other related information, these communities have no choice but to retain consultants and lawyers to develop studies and arguments to review and rectify errors in the count that would be easily discovered from the Census Bureau's data directly. Although privacy concerns are important and must be addressed, these concerns alone do not justify shielding Detroit from its own metrics. Transparency and accuracy demand that the Census Bureau be more forthcoming in sharing data files with the communities most impacted by them. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Marinoff. Our next witness uh, is Charles Anderson, President and CEO of the Urban League of Detroit and Southeastern Michigan, where he served as the chapter sixth and eighth president. For two decades, Mr. Anderson has been responsible for the vision, leadership, and direction of the Urban League of Detroit and Southeastern Michigan. Mr. Anderson helped lead local and statewide community outreach efforts uh, during the 2020 census. Mr. Anderson was previously involved with the uh, Charlotte NAACP Youth Council, where he later served as president and helped organize the NAACP Youth Council radio show, Talk to the People, on WGIV Radio in Charlotte, North Carolina, and co-hosted the NAACP television program, Experience. He has also served on the NAACP national staff as director of the Midwest region. Mr. Anderson, welcome to the committee. You may proceed with your opening remarks. Thank you, Chairman Peters. I uh, don't got the information from you. We're way back in my history. Thank you very much for reminding me of those things. But thank you also for this opportunity to testify today in reviewing the 2020 census local perspectives in Michigan. Specifically, thank you for bringing the focus of the census home to Michigan, which unfortunately and regrettably lost a congressional seat following the 2020 census. I do want to also say thank you to Mayor Duggan for advocating for a complete count of Detroit and formally challenging our Census Bureau's 2020 numbers. I'm honored to be part of the witness panel of outstanding leaders, experts, and community organizers who continually strive to make the state of Michigan and the city of Detroit an international metropolis that serves the needs of all of its residents. Um, 
Everybody is one of 92 of Sherwoods, uh, the National Urban League across 36 states and uh, the District of Columbia. The Urban League movement serves well over 2 million people per year and enables an African Americans and others in underserved communities to achieve their highest human potential and secure economic self reliance, parity, power, and civil rights. And I'm glad and proud to say that the Detroit Urban League is serving between 13 and 15,000 citizens each month, uh, more than 125,000 annually. And we have programs such as WIC uh, uh, and uh, Urban Seniors Jobs Program for Seniors where funding in our community is based on those census numbers. So we're very uh, concerned about an accurate count. It's, uh, as part of this mission, the National Urban League did convene the 2020 Census Black Roundtable with over 20 national civil rights organizations to organize and strategize ahead of the many obstacles that threatens an accurate count of black people in this country and in turn the central resources that are needed. Over the years, in past censuses, it has been a real privilege to partner with the U.S. government to conduct the census. But unfortunately, as you indicated, mentioned, Mr. Chairman, the 2020 census did not feel like a truly friendly effort. The Urban League neighborhood absolutely applauds the Census Bureau rank and file staff for its work, but it was really difficult under unheard political influences and global pandemic that is still wreaking havoc on the lives of many, including the city of Detroit. Uh, it is still challenging to feel like we were working together uh, to make sure that there was, was an accurate count. The, uh, we, we used our efforts, our social media, uh, used all available resources with some extra for, focuses on social media to make sure that we communicated with the clients, the, the 125,000 people that we would serve in a year just to send out information, encourage them to participate in the census. But uh, it was a challenging year, it's already been shared. The Urban League does urge the Census Bureau to continue to identify opportunity to correct the numbers to reflect an accurate count of our community so that federal funding needs are addressed. Uh, we would urge the Census Bureau to extend broad flexibility and review the local challenges to the 2020 Census. And finally, we would suggest that there are concerns with prison gerrymandering. Michigan has an incarceration rate of 599 per 100,000 people, including jails, prisons, immigration detention, juvenile justice facilities. A country locks up a higher percentage of its population than those in democracy. This prison industrial complex is felt especially hard by the black community who make up 14% of the state's population, but 50% of those who are imprisoned. Uh, when 68 black people are in prison in Michigan, arguably many of them could have been counted as Detroit citizens if in fact the, there was consideration given for that. So we appreciate the opportunity to focus on where the census is and the opportunity we have to correct the mistakes that were made during the census. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Our next witness is uh, Jane Garcia, Vice Chair of La Sied, uh, the Latin Americans for Social and Economic Development, a nonprofit agency serving the Detroit Hispanic community. La Sied uh, assists community members with a variety of services and help conduct census outreach uh, in 2020. Uh, Ms. Garcia herself is also a former uh, census uh, employee. Uh, in addition, uh, Ms. Garcia is the founder of Corporate Responsibility Through Advocacy, an organization that advocates for minority board members and minority representation at all levels. Prior to serving on the board, Ms. Garcia served as part of the Executive Committee of the United Way Community Services for 20 years. Ms. Garcia is a licensed social worker and has been a community advo uh, advo uh, advo uh, activist for over uh, 45 years. Ms. Garcia, welcome uh, to the committee. You may proceed with your opening remarks. You may want to pull that closer. I'm hoping this is on. Is this yeah, on? Pull it really close. Pull it really close. Huh? Yeah, pull it close. Pull it close. Okay. Thank you so closer. much. <clears throat> Bring it up further. Okay. Thank you so much, Senator. We really are very grateful that uh, we are participating. I thank the panelists. Uh, you know, the issue of the census has been very close to our hearts uh, for many years. I served... Uh, for the census, I did four censuses. I understood the importance of the outreach and the participation from all levels, government, local government, and 
um, and the nonprofits, especially the people that did not speak uh, English. We thought that the bilingual services needed to be really stressed out uh, during this past census. Uh, to me, the, this census was not prepared for the influx of immigrants, uh, did not want to count immigrants, if I remember correctly, I heard. So the issue was very clear that the undercount was going to be going across the country, not just in Michigan. We were very fortunate. Uh, the mayor got on board very early and, and tried to get out as much information as possible to the communities. We thought that the, and we stressed this, that in 2012, uh, somebody in power decided that they were going to close 50% um, of the regional offices. Unfortunately, one of them was in Michigan. And that one was really tough on us because they were the ones that did all the surveys and those were surveys that included the, you know, the estimates that were very important to keeping up the information that led up to the census. Uh, people don't realize that the census starts uh, for 10 years, we get prepared. And the reason is because we have so much, they have so much to do in the short time of 10 years past real fast when we're trying to make sure that everyone is counted and the benefits that's going to come back to our city. Um, obviously, a very unfortunately for Michigan, we lost a congressional seat. Um, and that's going to be really hard on us for the going forward when you look at how the how the people will fight for representation. I thought that was very important to mention that. Uh, the undercount uh, was very specifically um, notable because we did not have the partnerships. Uh, like the mayor had said before, they started late and ended early. So the issue was very clear. There wasn't enough resources. We need you to please stress, Mr. Senator, that the resources need to be put on now to continue. Otherwise, in 2030, Michigan may not even be here. I mean, seriously, when you look at what we need to do, we need to make sure that they have proper people that represent the community, that they go door to door, that they have nonprofits that are partners ongoing. Ongoing means that you need to make sure that they get the information that's being vital to them. The surveys, the estimates, the data, everything that's needed for us to grow. And I think that that's gonna be very important as we go forward for the 2030. Like I said, implementation of reopening some presence in Michigan, we think is vital. Uh, and especially to have people that represent our communities that have been underserved. So that I think that we need to stress that more than ever. The po population obviously is moving more Southwest, uh, but we lost uh, a lot of congressional seats in the Northeast area. So we need to make sure that uh, accurate count, a more accurate count is done uh, going forward. Um, I think they need to really look at what exactly they did with, with any of the resources that they did have. It did not come back to the community, and that's something we need to really stress. As we move forward, the census is a very expensive process. I, we understand that, but we do know that if we don't have that resources that actually do the outreach to the community that especially is underserved, that we're going to have a real problem. So I thank you. I'm hoping that you go back and you, you advocate that they look at making sure that Michigan may have some bit of a presence so that continues to grow and that our, we do not lose any more population, at least the undercount, uh, that won't be well significant. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Our next witness is Maha uh, Frasch, uh, President and CEO of Arab Community Center for Economic and Social Services, or ACCESS. It's the largest Arab American community nonprofit uh, in the United States. Ms. Frasch uh, is a dedicated visionary in the Arab American community whose work focuses on philanthropy and building strong institutions to strengthen the voice of the Middle Eastern and North American community in American civil society. This has included advocacy around representation of this community in the census and other federal uh, data. She has been a key leader in growing access from a regional human service organization to the only national Arab American community foundation in the United States and a leading organization addressing the many complex issues that face the Arab American community. In addition, uh, Ms. Frasch currently serves as a member of the Michigan State Board of Ethics and as a trustee on the Council of Michigan Foundations. Welcome to the committee. Uh, you may proceed with your opening remarks. Thank you, Senator, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it is 
truly on my honor to address this committee on behalf of Access, the nation's largest service provider to Middle Eastern and North African Armenian communities. For the Armenian community and the entire country at large, the, success, the successful execution of the decennial census is one of the most important activities that the United States government supports. The decennial census produces our fundamental understanding of who lives in our country, what they need, where they are, and what they are going through. And input from community-based organizations like ACCESS is a vital part of the preparation for this community's oversight process. Community-based organizations are the connective tissue between policymakers, agency officials, and individuals, families, and communities who seek representation in the census. This was the case for many Americans and individuals of MENA descent who fought for formal recognition by the Census Bureau in a long and rigorous process where the Census Bureau convened community representatives and technical experts around the question of how to best test, assess, and implement a response category for MENA self-identification. At the conclusion of this process, Census Bureau list, uh, issued a formal recommendation to the Trump administration to use a dedicated Middle Eastern or North African response category. However, before the OMB could decide on the Census Bureau's recommendation, the Trump administration's Department of Commerce decided to, to undermine and ignore the Census Bureau's official recommendation. As a result, individuals from the New York region were misrecognized on the decennial census. They continue to be misunderstood, understudied, and formally excluded from the policy making process. As we begin the census preparation process, we must remember what response category has already been researched, tested, and formally recommended. We must also remember that on 2018, the current administration supports the mission of the Census Bureau to develop a complete and accurate portrayal of our nation's diversity. Access remains hopeful and expectant that a new category can be established across the federal government in time for the inauguration of the 2030 census. However, Access also recognizes that new inclusions is, inclusion is only part of the work of closing census coverage gaps, which has historically led to poor census response rates in the state of Michigan. In the lead up to the 2020 census, Access co chaired the Michigan Nonprofit Complete Count Committee with the Michigan Nonprofit Association. The objectives of the committee were simple to improve response rates across the state of Michigan and increase understanding of the census impact by providing culturally and linguistically relevant civic education through direct engagement at, at the grassroots level and through trusted voices. We also intended to push back on the Trump administration's citizenship question and the politicization of the Census Bureau's statistical function. Our impact was felt in both process and outcome. Altogether, the committee had direct representation of 82 out of 83 Michigan counties. We were able to raise the state's Michigan response rates from near the bottom in previous census periods to among the top 10 nationwide in 2020. Through that work, we believe that we have built a model that can be replicated across the nation to close gaps in census coverage and improve the public understanding of its impact. Throughout the remainder of this hearing, I will be happy to speak other lessons learned about our other lessons learned from the preparation for and execution of the 2020 census, which suffered from an unprecedented pandemic 
a systemic politicization of statistical functions and communication breakdowns between government and civil society. Among these learned lessons include the importance of maintaining adequate funding levels for research operations, field personnel, um, digital infrastructure, and data security. It also included um, also included our lessons concerning the value of preparing community-based organizations to effectively communicate the data integrity and security of the census operations. I eagerly await your questions and look forward to the work preparing for the 2030 census that returns the decennial census of it to its original function. And thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. French. Our final witness is Kelly Kuhn, President and CEO of the Michigan Nonprofit Association, a charitable organization dedicated to nonprofits and the communities they serve by promoting anti-racism and social justice. During the census, the Michigan Nonprofit Association led the statewide Census 2020 Michigan Nonprofits Count Campaign, mobilizing nonprofits and government partners to encourage census participation. As president and CEO, Ms. Kuhn is the driving force behind Michigan Nonprofit Association's strategic direction and operations, and has served in several different roles at the organization over the past 14 years, including vice president. Previously, Ms. Kuhn worked uh, for the Greater Jackson Chamber of Commerce, the Jackson County Community Foundation, and the Jackson Nonprofit Support Center. Ms. Kuhn, welcome uh, to the committee. You may proceed with your opening remarks. Thank you, Chairman Peters. Good morning, my name is Kelly Kuhn, President and CEO of Michigan Nonprofit Association. Founded in 1990, MA is a 501c3 statewide membership organization that serves nonprofits through advocacy, training, and resources. MA is dedicated to promoting anti racism and social justice in the nonprofit sector. The 2020 census was more than a population count, it was an opportunity to make a difference and to shape Michigan's future. M&A and the Council of Michigan Foundations, with financial support of more than 40 foundations and the state of Michigan, launched an ambitious campaign to mobilize nonprofits and help Michigan get a complete and accurate count in the 2020 census. The campaign raised more than $10 million and engaged hundreds of nonprofits in a nonpartisan, multiracial coalition with for-profit organizations and government. Nonprofits invested energy, time, and commitment in the Michigan Nonprofit Counts campaign to ensure a fair and accurate census for all communities, particularly Michigan's historically undercounted populations, people of color, immigrants and their families, young children, seniors, people who live in poverty, and people experiencing homelessness. The undercount has led to inequality in political power, government funding, and private sector investments for these communities. Thus, the Nonprofit Counts campaign was developed, leveraging nonprofits as trusted outreach partners with a specific goal to reach these undercounted groups. To reach diverse populations and encourage completion of the census, as well as serve as champions of the campaign, MA entered into a partnership with New Michigan Media a network that includes more than 140 ethnic and non-traditional media outlets across Michigan. Dr. Hyde Oshagan, president of New Michigan Media, convened three media summits that inform the messaging directions of the campaign. The campaign's intentional focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion in grant making resulted in all grants being awarded to organizations serving historically undercounted populations. The campaign worked with government officials at all levels to maximize effectiveness. This cooperation primarily resulted in avoiding duplication of efforts and enhancing outreach. We received regular updates from Michigan's state demographer, collaborated with the Census Bureau's partnership specialists, and held specific training sessions and webinars on how to engage local government entities so they were ready for the 2020 census. While getting the census count has never been an easy task, when we started this journey in 2017, we couldn't have predicted what was to come in 2020. We faced multiple challenges, including confusion over the late addition of a citizenship question, disinformation, misinformation, and a global pandemic that caused shifting deadlines and wreaked havoc with our get out the count plans. 
with Michigan under a stay at home order and suffering one of the highest COVID-19 rates in the nation in the spring of 2020, the nonprofit counts campaign had to quickly retool. Nonprofits were creative and flexible, yet still sensitive and safe given the crisis. The campaign adjusted by expanding digital outreach, creating videos for children now that kids were at home, expanding texting campaigns, and identifying new partners. Nonprofits also had a presence in the few places people were still frequenting in person, such as food banks. Filling out the census online, by mail, or over phone was not an option for some due to the lack of internet access, language, reading barriers, and other concerns. Thanks in part to nonprofits, hard work, Michigan finished eighth in the U.S. in self-response rate. On June 17, 2020, we became the first state in the nation to have exceeded its 2010 self-response rate. We also ranked third best in the nation for the largest gain in statewide response from the 2010 census, rising from 67.7% to 71.3%. Most importantly, at the local level, in every census track where the nonprofit campaign was active, the self-response rate averaged 7% higher than in census tracks where the campaign was not active. Going forward, we are sharing concrete examples of ways our partners can engage in census work throughout the decade. Underlying the activities are the policy and advocacy work that needs to be done all decade long to ensure adequate funding for the Census Bureau, advocacy for updated questionnaires, including revised race, ethnicity questions, and sexual orientation and gender identity questions, and input on operational changes, and any legislative recommendations resulting from the experiences and aftermath of the 2020 Census. MA regularly communicates with the network that was built in 2020. We include results of the census data, webinars on using the data, opportunities for advocacy, and much more. By investing our time now, we can lay a strong foundation for those who will work to get our communities counted in 2030. The success that Michigan had in 2020 census couldn't have happened without nonprofits. Nonprofits are trusted entities serving as catalysts for continued civic and community engagement. The Nonprofit Counts campaign built a strong foundation for a fairer and more equitable Michigan where everyone counts and every voice is heard. I'd like to thank Chairman Peters and his staff for the opportunity to speak today. We are grateful for your work on the census and everything you do on behalf of Michigan's nonprofits. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Kuhn, and, and thank you to, uh, to each of uh, our witnesses uh, here today. Uh, it's clear in, in listening to the, the testimony uh, that we had some significant challenges uh, before us uh, to get through this uh, census. Some of these uh, issues emerged uh, early. Uh, I, I would argue that part of the problem was the fact that uh, the Republican Congress uh, in place uh, from 2012 to 2016 uh, underinvested uh, in the census. And as many of you mentioned, uh, early investments are critically important for getting an accurate count uh, at the, the end. Uh, then uh, we had the COVID pandemic hit that uh, added even more challenges uh, that made that problem even more apparent. Uh, in addition, and I've heard from some of you about uh, Trump administration uh, interference, and clearly uh, we saw that firsthand uh, in the final months and weeks as the administration actually cut uh, the census short when we were trying to make sure the time was taken to actually make sure that we have an accurate count, it was cut uh, short. Uh, this was occurred despite a lot of pushback from myself and my colleagues, uh, as well as all of you on the ground who are saying we need to make sure we do this right. Uh, let's not cut this short. Uh, that's what happened. My question then for all of the, the witnesses, and I'll start with you, uh, Mayor Duggan, and then we, I think we just go down the, the table in the, in the order that you're at. You've already discussed uh, some of the, the top challenges, but I think for the committee record, it's important for us to hear. You know, what, what, what was the top one or two challenges that uh, were really very difficult uh, in your community or the communities that you serve uh, that we, uh, cer we certainly want to focus on all the challenges, but what are the two things that really stand out uh, that we need to be focused on? Mayor? Well, as a number of the witnesses have indicated, we had an enormous uh, community effort going. The problem was entirely uh, the central staffing, and there were some dedicated workers working for the Census Bureau, lifetime Detroiters who are out there, and they were telling us, uh, we can't get our lists. And then, as it got to be September and they were behind, they started getting messages from the Census Bureau. 
$500 relocation fee if you'll move to Indiana. They actually, at the time Detroit was the furthest behind, the Census Bureau was incentivizing lifetime Detroiters to move to another state. And probably the most depressing thing, and, and something I hope somebody will look into, but in May, the Census Bureau had decided to go from 10 weeks to seven weeks non-response follow-up, but in May they said, we are gonna put resources in in 12 states to start a week early, add a week to the non-response follow-up. We were excited, we're gonna gear up early. They're genuinely trying. And then when they announced where the extra week was in the state of Michigan, it was in Oakland County. Now at the time, Oakland County had a 77% response rate, Detroit had a 49% response rate. And the Census Bureau said, we're gonna put extra counting effort in to the state of Michigan and it's going to go to Oakland County. And this was it, no matter what everybody here did, when the people who are actually running the program stick their thumb on the scale, it, it just became impossible to overcome. Thank you, Mayor. Dr. Marnoff, what, what did you see? What is a significant challenge or two? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, we've talked about some of these. We've talked about the uncertainty um, related to the pandemic. We also talked about the uncertainty and chaos from the proposal to add a citizenship question. Um, one, one thing we didn't touch on as much was the budgetary uncertainty that the census faced, especially in the years leading up to the census, which led to the cancellation of some tests and programs, one of them being the active block resolution program, which would have more effectively guided the field operation. But as the mayor was pointing out, I think the biggest challenge here was or the set of challenges were the ones associated with the non-response follow-up operation. Um, there was this emphasis in this in the 2020 census for the first time on internet self-response um, as the mayor already indicated in his testimony that created real disparities especially in black and brown communities where people had less access to the internet it also led to a lower self-response rate citywide in 2020 than we had in 2010 when it was more of a paper pencil operation uh, and i just also want to emphasize that in our data this housing audit that i talked about we found that the housing undercount that we documented was three and a half times more pronounced in neighborhoods with the lowest self-response rates. That's where less than a quarter of the residents were able to self-respond to the census compared to those in the highest self neighborhoods with the highest self-response rates where over three quarters were able to self-respond on the internet. These are the places that need the most field work, the most uh, non-response follow-up operation. And the very powerful statements attached to the mayor's uh, testimony from census workers really show clearly that they were not getting it. Um, it, was, it was late getting started, early ending, but it was also mismanaged along the way. And, um, and I, I think what's, what's illuminating here is that the census has already showed us, the Census Bureau, that, that, area, that, that when you have to do more non-response follow-up, you're likely to get less accurate population counts. We're showing that that also holds true for housing counts, that one of the reasons why we're not counting enough population is that we're not sending enough field workers out to actually enumerate the housing units, which is then translating into an undercount in the population. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Yes, Senator, it's, it's hard to add anything after the mayor and uh, Dr. Milhoff speaks, but I would like to add that, you know, as Ms. Garcia mentioned in her testimony, um, census closed offices and historically there have been people between 2010 2020 or folk who you worked with you were involved with they were part of the community they knew the community and you had a relationship with them and so um, those ongoing year-round relationships were lost when offices were closed and staff were, were relocated and you started hiring people who were not familiar or as the mayor said were incentivized to leave uh, the community uh, I think there were mixed messaging. The messages that were out there uh, were uh, questions about uh, well, citizenship, uh, questions about whether the census is going to end early or, or continue on. The, the messaging that the community was hearing, they hear us, and as Ms. Kuhn was saying, the community is making all of this effort, nonprofits are talking to people, and then we are being challenged by what others are saying. So um, uh, I would add that that was uh, part of the problem for making sure the census uh, count was accurate. Thank you. Ms. Garcia. 
Yes, thank you, Senator. Um, one of the things I think is real important, like we had mentioned, presence is going to be very important as we move forward, and we don't have the presence today. I think the immediately of, of a presence of some kind of a regional offices, maybe that can continue. Uh, nowhere in our history had we ever seen the government cut 50% uh, of, of any governmental units in an area. I mean, they went from 12 regional offices to six. That that just added to the confusion. I also think that as you look forward, Senator, that you look at the people that are at the Bureau of the Census, and please don't put the people that are at the Bureau of the Census in charge of the 2030. Obviously, I'm not very confident that the ones that were in charge did a good job for 2020. So I think all that needs to be really looked at because I think it's very important that partnerships be emphasized because partnerships and relationships to making sure that whether it's in, whether it's the Indian reservations or our local communities that do not get left out because there is a relationship that we continue to build on that. So I would appreciate that, sir. Absolutely. Thank you. Ms. Fresh. So, Senator, for us, I mean, a lot has been said, of course, but the main thing I want to uh, re-emphasize here for our community in particular, the, the biggest challenge was um, the fear and mistrust that developed in the community uh, because of the politicization of the of the operations of the census. And so, uh, and of course, you know, having a pandemic and dealing with an immigrant community that um, has barriers uh, in terms of uh, language, uh, uh, with the pandemic, people needed access to Wi Fi, they needed to be comfortable with, with using uh, digital tools. All these, I would say, I would say they were major, major, major special challenges uh, during the 2020 census, in particular for our community. Uh, and in addition, uh, you know, the funding level and investment uh, from the census bureau uh, was not, was not really implemented as it was uh, originally planned for. So investment in community-based efforts to have education campaigns and and the uh, field workers that will reach out to community members and hold them by the arm and gain their trust to make sure that they do fill uh, the, the, the census uh, were cut short and the efforts that were done actually were funded by private foundations and, um, and state government. So I would say these two areas um, are the main biggest challenges we faced. All right. Thank you. Ms. Kuhn. Thank you. Um, from the very beginning, just echoing what has already been said, there was a lot of confusion, misinformation, and a lack of understanding of how the census data was um, and how it's to be used for. Um, also, what has already been stated, the lack of trust. When we think about um, trust in federal and local government, for some it was about experiences in countries from which they've immigrated, as well as experiences that they've had while being in the U.S. And lastly, there were security concerns and lack of understanding of how protected the data is. And these were concerns throughout the campaign that we experienced and were very difficult to overcome in the communities that we were working with. Thank you. I'm going to ask this uh, question of all the witnesses again, and uh, we're just going to keep the same format. Mayor uh, Duggan will, will, will kick it off. Uh, we, we, we raised a number of challenges, and I, and I want to drill deeper into these challenges because we make improvements and, and also have an opportunity to fix what may not have worked uh, the first time because it has a significant impact on communities, and we're gonna, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on that. But before we do that, I think it's also important for us to focus on some successes. We, we had a lot of great work. You were, All of you were involved in a lot of great work here on the ground to, to get out the work. So I, I would like each of you to mention what, what you think uh, was a success uh, in the in the 2020 census, uh, what was perhaps an improvement from 2010, and perhaps some local efforts uh, that we should look at as a model going forward for future census, because clearly we did a lot of great things on the ground. Mayor, you were instrumental here. I know there were a lot of great successes in the city of Detroit. I'd like to hear a little bit of that for the committee's benefit. Well, in the city and statewide, I've never seen the level of cooperation we had. The Latino community, the Arab American community, the Asian communities, you go right down the list, the Bengali communities, we had people out with trusted voices uh, everywhere. And I think it did pay off statewide. 
across the state of Michigan, there was an uptick, and it was because of all of the efforts that you heard about today. And I think there's a lot to be proud of in the community effort. Uh, the problem was the people actually in charge of counting uh, weren't there, but I think everybody up here ought to take credit uh, for really what turned out to be a remarkable number statewide. Thank you, Dr. Barnett. Yeah, thank you. I would echo everything the mayor just said and also add a few thoughts of my own. Uh, first of all, just the mere fact that the 2020 census was completed as close to schedule as it was is a major accomplishment. And despite all the criticisms I have of the way that the 2020 census was operated, especially locally, um, the, the, the Bureau itself and the, peop the really fine data scientists and people working at the Census Bureau deserve a ton of credit for adopting to the most difficult of circumstances. Um, they also deserve credit for some planning in the years leading up to the census, really early on, as some of our witnesses have talked about. These in include things like the increased use of field automation, the wider use of administrative records in census processes, um, a modernization of the way they develop address lists, um, increased use of internet response, and this new non-ID processing system, which made it more feasible for people to complete a census return anytime, anywhere, without requiring contact in the mail or by an enumerator. The problem is that these are things that work very well nationally on a, on a global scale, but the census count is really a hyper-local phenomenon, and they don't work equally well everywhere. And as we've already talked about, in places where so many people have trouble accessing the internet, where administrative records may not be as complete and accurate as they are in other parts of the country, we can't depend on these innovative, but you know, in other places, very successful efforts. Um, so we need more work on things like the ground game, the non-response follow-up operation, which we've already talked about. So I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Yes, I, I think, as I said in my written testimony, I thought I, I did give commendations to the um, to some of the regional staff that were in place, the professionalism that they, in spite of political interference, they persevered and pressed on to uh, get the job done. So you know, we're very, we don't ignore or uh, don't get a recognition to that. But I also thought it was helpful and very significant that we are, um, put resources in place, uh, hiring Vicki Kavori and others, and got the community involved in thinking about the census very early. Uh, it was important that the Michigan Nonprofit Association receive uh, significant support. Um, as the, uh, Kelly indicated, you know, $10 million plus dollars from state and other monies were made available, so we were able to run commercials, do use uh, social media, and do a number of things to try to bring the census alive to the community and make sure uh, people knew about what was happening. I thought those were all uh, important steps that were made uh, toward the census this year, it's 2020. Thank you. Ms. Garcia? I think, I think that uh, one of the things that were real positive, it could have been a lot worse, Senator, had we not had all these people on the ground, it could have been a lot worse. So I think that when you look at that aspect, all the work that the nonprofits did kind of picked up the ball. Uh, where the government wasn't present here. So they're the ones that, whether people like it or not, um, and there was an undercount, and, and historically there's been an undercount. Uh, so it's just an issue of the trust, uh, you know, the issue of people did not answer the doors automatically, and during the pandemic it got worse. People did not come to the doors. So the enumeration was very difficult for the people that were hired for the enumeration. Uh, but I think that all the work that the nonprofits did, I think, did help. And I think that the issue was that it, Doc, like it could have been a lot worse. That's what I, you know, I keep looking at that aspect. And I think the networks that were made between the nonprofits um, uh, to know that it, how important, because we've been working on this for a long time, to know how important it was, I thought, developed that network that also brought the Bureau of the Census questions to them and saying, hey, you know, we need this, we need that. It was very late coming, and they used to have an advisory board uh, in Washington, and that was eliminated during the 2020. So there was a lot of things that could have been worse. So when you look at that aspect, I think that because of our partnerships, that we may have not gotten the number that we wanted or the number that we know that we should have, but at least it could have been a lot worse, Senator. Justice. For me, Senator, um, you know, on the 
big fan of uh, the resilience and the innovation of communities on the ground and all grassroots kind of efforts, uh, where, you know, they need to be celebrated and um, uh, and emphasized. So for me, uh, you know, the work of the Michigan Complete Count Committee uh, and our partnership with the Michigan Nonprofit Association uh, is is really truly something to celebrate and to replicate all over the country in the future. Um, we had so much success in Michigan. In Michigan. Uh, it was truly a partnership between um, um, you know communities, government, businesses, uh, and and private foundations. Uh, we all came together. And we made sure that we reached out to community-based organizations in 82 of the counties out of the 83 counties in Michigan. And we made sure that they are provided with the resources that they need to make them effective at running the education campaign and the field work that will allow them to be impactful in engaging the constituencies that they are serving and thus increase the participation response from those communities. So this is something that in my book um, needs to be celebrated a great deal and needs to be replicated all over the country in the 2020 census. Thank you. I'll just add that one of the big successes for our campaign was the multiple ways for people to fill out the census. We appreciated the intentional effort to have materials in various language. We found that very helpful. Also, I think it's important to lift up a very um, great example of some local efforts, keeping in mind that on April 1st, 2020, we designated that as Census Day. So imagine within a few days of the lockdown, nearly every planned census event was canceled and the effects rippled throughout communities around the state. In Detroit alone, at least 90 census promotional events were canceled and replaced by virtual phone banks run by the city's census captains. With original plans on hold indefinitely, nonprofit organizations changed course. For example, Groups be began distributing census information on flyers through programs such as Gleaners Community Food Banks, Community Food Distribution Sites, Meals on Wheels, and Detroit Area Agency on Aging. Along with the census information, organizations also doled out gloves, masks, hand sanitizers, and social distance reminders to help mitigate COVID-19 transmission in the city, which was devastated by the coronavirus pandemic. Thank you, Ms. Goon. I want to kind of uh, continue to talk a little bit about community outreach efforts uh, before we uh, uh, tackle some other um, important issues. Uh, the, the Bureau certainly seemed to, to work to forge some relationships through their partnership program. Some of you have alluded to that in your testimony. They did some targeted advertising in local media. Uh, they provided uh, the census uh, in 13 uh, different languages. However, I think we all agree, and I certainly heard this uh, from most of you, that uh, they were slow when it came to providing in-person types of contacts, which are particularly critical for hard to count uh, areas. Uh, they were slow to set up assistance uh, centers, uh, especially in those areas with less uh, internet access, which is what we find here clearly in the city uh, of Detroit. Uh, we pushed the Bureau. Uh, we did provide additional funding for those assistance centers. However, uh, I don't think that was ever fully implemented, unfortunately, uh, by the folks uh, who, are, who were running that, uh, and it should have been. Uh, but what I'd like to ask uh, uh, each of you is that when it comes to community outreach uh, sp specifically, is there something you would have added that just simply wasn't done by the Census Bureau uh, that they should have done to help us reach particularly hard to count folks um, in the city of Detroit as well as other places uh, around the state? Mayor, what, what would you suggest? So, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to go back to my time in 1980 as a follow-up response enumerator knocking on doors in Ann Arbor. Uh, and pre-computer, they gave me a stack of blank forms and 300 addresses, and those were my assignments for the week. And I went and knocked on doors in neighborhoods in racially mixed neighborhoods in Ann Arbor. And anybody who wants to tell you about the theory about racial undercount, I saw it firsthand when the government knocks on the doors of black and brown families and wants to know who lives in the house, how much do you make, and what your jobs are. 
they are more distrustful of the government rep knocking on the door than Caucasians are. That's just the truth. There's been a lot of studies to show it, uh, but I, I feel like I can relate to anybody. I saw it firsthand, and I don't think the Census Bureau can do it. I think it has to be the groups like these. It has to be uh, the trusted voices. Uh, and I think it's something that, uh, with the exception of the outreach getting stopped by the COVID, we did well. We had every single group in the city. We had trusted voices in the community, uh, at the neighborhood events. And so I don't blame the Census Bureau for that. I think the, the trusted voice outreach has to come from us. That's where the partnership needs to be. We just want to make sure once the trusted voices say, do this, somebody actually shows up at the door uh, and, and takes your information. Thank you, Mayor. Murnoff? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Senator Peters. Um, my colleagues on this panel know a tremendous about, amount about community outreach and can speak from their perspectives much more strongly to this than I can. So I'm going to I'm going to take a more expansive view of the question here and talk about community outreach in the form of interfacing between the Census Bureau and local governments. And, uh, and I want to talk about something called the local update of census address operation or the LUCA operation, which takes place in the years leading up to the census, particularly in 2018 and 2019. And this was created in 1994 by Congress through the Census Address List Improvement Act, which was really revolutionary at the time. It gave local governments an opportunity to review the address list that the census was using to go out and do its enumeration. And I can assure you, if we didn't have that in place, the results would be even worse. The problem is that it's only a limited um, opportunity to review those lists, and that window of opportunity ends before the census operation begins in around 2019. So as the mayor alluded to in his testimony, we saw that the count that the Census Bureau had in its master address file in, 20, in 2019 dropped by over 58,000 housing units in the 2020 census, but we don't know how because the city or researchers are not allowed to see the, the update of the master address file. So I think that Congress can play a really constructive role here in expanding the LUCA operation, the local update of census addresses, by going back and revisiting that really important 1994 legislation and providing for a more continual um, partnership between local governments and the Census Bureau in developing and updating the master address file, which could really help uh, um, lead to a more accurate count and, and fewer mistakes of the kind that we're seeing in Detroit. Thank you. Mr. Anderson. Yeah, I, I would just try to say this as succinctly as possible, but certainly seek or maintain community partnerships um, leading up to the census. Um, try to maintain the simplicity um, and technology can only improve. I mean, what we had this April 1st and the opportunity to go online and within five minutes or less complete the census, I would imagine that going forward, that process could be even more simplified. Thank you. Senator, I will go back to the resources. I think that's very important. I did four censuses, and I think of all the censuses that I did, 2,000 was one of the best, and it's because they poured all the resources they could for the accurate count, for the return uh, addresses, uh, follow-up. I mean, they just spend a lot of money uh, to make sure that we had an accurate count. We still had an undercount, but it would have been a lot worse. And I think it, you have to depend on the resources, whether and they should start, like, not two years before uh, the next census, but ongoing, some, some sort of ongoing through the whole decade, so that by the time you hit two years before the census, people aren't afraid to at least understand and educate them to understand why they have to fill out the census and how important it is to their community, whether they put up a new school or they put up a new clinic. And I think that that is something that's very important. We deal with migrants and migrants come and go and we wanna make sure they're counted where they're living at at the time of April 1st. So those are the things that I think needs to be in place so that we can improve uh, how our numbers are for the state and how much resources will come back for the next 10 years. Um, for me, I want to re-emphasize re how um, I didn't answer this question. Really, it is about at the end of the day. Uh, we know that the Census Bureau is a professional, you know, 
institution with very, very talented scientists who put uh, and, and put together the digital tools and the uh, data security tools and, um, and, and had major linguistic kind of uh, tools that were um, provided to the communities. The only issue is that the dissemination of these resources cannot and couldn't be done in a an effective way by those professionals, and there is a need to depend on community based, trusted voices that can take these tools and make sure that they are disseminated to the actual participants uh, and communities that these organizations serve. So that's my main response to this one. Um, I will just add a couple things. I would consider um, starting earlier with the partnership specialties and, um, specialists in communities. Um, some communities, they were very successful, and others, we had not so much success. Um, also, when thinking about that as the Bureau gears up for 2030, they should take into consideration maybe more ethnic census field workers to create greater trust in these communities, as many of us have said on the panel. And lastly, we'd also like to see a stronger role for ethnic and non-traditional media in the overall communications plan, especially for small media outlets. Michigan has a robust network, which is an asset. Not many other states have that, and we should take advantage of their trust and reach in community. Thank you. Uh, uh, I have a more directed uh, question here just to uh, Ms. Prej. Uh, related to the Arab American uh, population uh, and some of the unique challenges uh, of counting uh, that uh, community. Uh, I've certainly been fighting for a long time uh, to have a separate uh, category for people of Middle Eastern and North African uh, descent, uh, which we call the, the MENA category. Um, and uh, we were making some real progress yes. uh, with a long fight uh, up through uh, 2016 mm -hmm. uh, until the uh, Trump administration uh, basically put a halt to that and mm -hmm. uh, ended uh, that program. Uh, we're uh, continuing to fight, however, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm happy to say that OMB has now elevated this as a priority and in June uh, announced that they're going to begin the process uh, to revise uh, uh, these standards, which I think mm -hmm. are very encouraging. Yes. But I'd like to have you speak on the record uh, as to how you, do you believe that OMB, including the MENA category in the standard, is going to help not only the Census Bureau, but also other federal agencies collect more accurate and more inclusive uh, data uh, that we need in order to make sure we deal with the unique uh, needs of this community. Thank you so much uh, for this question, Senator. Uh, as I said earlier, we remain hopeful and expect expectant that the OMB will move to establish a MENA category across the federal government when they revise the federal standards for data on race and ethnicity. Our expectation is due at the large part to your steadfast support for the civil and human right of our community to statistical recognition and political representation. So thank you very much for your leadership, Senator. There are two main ways we think that a new category will help all federal agencies collect more accurate and inclusive data. First, the Census Bureau already tested the practical utility and statistical validity of a MENA response category. In the 2015 National Content Test, they found it captured the survey responses of those in the MENA working definition. It did not capture the responses of those who could have thought they were MENA, but were not in the working definition. And it made more individuals, particularly black and Hispanic individuals, sure of their self-identification. These findings cast into stark reality that the main category is just a good statistical category and, and it resonates with a discrete population that is conscious of itself in its terms it is unambiguous and it improves census response rates. Second, 
through the direct service work of access and other main community serving organization organizations within the national network for Arab American communities, we have observed that individuals of male descent tend to share certain characteristics not yet captured in federal data. Namely, individuals of male descent tend to have limited English proficiency, limited access to capital, poor or this desperate health outcomes, and barriers to established pathways to, to sustained and intergenerational academic and professional achievement. A new category would allow the litany of federal policies and programs that rely upon racial and ethnic data to recognize and address these conditions in their authorized activities. In conclusion, a new category provides for more accurate and inclusive data from a statistical perspective and increases the use of value statistical products, products across all federal agencies. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the, the Census Bureau has now released uh, some, some key census uh, results, including uh, under account uh, data. And uh, despite the, uh, the previous administration's uh, interference, which all of you have, uh, have referred to, uh, uh, the career officials uh, certainly persisted to, to take some time to process the data, and they've also released uh, many studies about the quality uh, of uh, that data, as you know. Unfortunately, uh, the data have revealed nationwide undercounts uh, for, for many groups, especially minorities. I think the mayor alluded to these numbers in, in your testimony, Mayor. Black people were undercounted by over 3%, uh, Latinos by nearly 5%, which is uh, three times uh, the 2010 undercount. Uh, there are also undercounts for Native Americans, uh, Asian Americans, young people, people who rent their homes, uh, and, and so much more. Uh, the, the Bureau, uh, unfortunately, does not tabulate local level undercounts, and this is has clearly very serious, I'm going to emphasize serious implications uh, for Michigan and, and some of our communities. Dr. Marnoff, I'm going to start with you. you. You've described your study on the likely undercount here in Detroit. My question to you is how, how does this compare to other cities? Uh, how does this fit in to the uh, national undercount data that uh, has now been released uh, by the, uh, the, the Census Bureau? Yes, thank you, Senator Peters, and, and thank you also for emphasizing the need for more local data uh, on, on these uh, metrics for how the census is performing, the, the post-enumeration survey in particular. So first, in some ways, the problems that were encountered in Detroit are emblematic of national trends. In other ways, it's really unique. So let me start with the commonalities. Uh, I see at least three commonalities. One of them you've already referred to, which is the undercounting of black and brown people. Um, and the mayor uh, already gave you those specific numbers. Another group that's maybe, that maybe receives less attention than it needs to is uh, households that are renting housing are undercounted relative to households that own their housing. And Detroit is a majority renter city. So that's important to emphasize. And then the, the third one is one that I've already referred to, but I will say again that Areas with lower self-response rates tend to get undercounted relative to areas with higher self-response rates. And Detroit was, was last in terms of the top 50 cities in its self-response rate. So these are all ways that Detroit fits into the national pattern. But there are also really important ways where it's a unique anomaly. And um, when you look, in, and I provide a lot of this data in my written testimony, but uh, when you look at a comparison of, say, the 50 largest cities and look at the population loss, the, the, the nearest comparable cities are places like Phoenix, San Antonio, Miami. What those places have in common are very large proportions of foreign-born populations and Latino populations in particular. And I'm not saying that this is not a factor in Detroit. It certainly is, but not to the extent that it is in these other cities where probably the kerfuffle over the introduction of, of the, or the proposed introduction of the citizenship question and the profound um, distrust that developed as a result of that had really profound effects on the undercount. Um, what makes Detroit distinct is that 
among all these cities, it was the only one that experienced not only a severe drop in its population count, but also an even more severe drop in its housing count. Um, and I think this is important because some other people might say, well, maybe this is just a result of the pandemic and people leaving the city. And there's two reasons why I don't think this is an explanation for what happened in the 2020 census. Uh, one of them is that if you look at national trends, the cities that lost the most population due to the pandemic, ha that happened in the subsequent year, 2020 to 2021. Um, the second reason is that the pandemic might provide an account for why people are leaving cities, but it doesn't provide an account for why housing units are being dropped from the books. And that's what's happening in Detroit. And so this tie into uh, like the, the, the population undercount being driven by the housing undercount really points to some unique circumstances that I think are really more reflective of the field operations that weren't going out and counting enough people in these housing units. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, actually, I, I've been reviewing uh, this uh, excellent report you put out, uh, uh, the analysis of the census 2020 count uh, in Detroit from the University of Michigan, uh, December 2021. Uh, this is an incredibly uh, comprehensive uh, document that, that really takes a look at the undercount that occurred here in Detroit and, and how significant it is and, and reasons. Uh, I'm going to enter this into the, uh, into the congressional uh, record here from the, from the hearing so that we can refer to that. But I certainly want to applaud the, the work that the University of Michigan has done um, on, on this issue. Thank you so much, Senator Peters. I and my colleagues greatly appreciate that. I know it's a, a group effort, but uh, we appreciate uh, uh, everybody. Mayor Duggan, um, uh, as we've uh, discussed, uh, the, this the study that we've entering into the, the record here uh, shows undercounted households in de some Detroit neighborhoods by as much as 8.1%, uh, over, over, over 8%. Uh, and we know Detroit is is home to many of the groups that has been discussed uh, that are undercounted on the national level. Uh, majority uh, African American city, a high percentage of renters, diversity. Uh, but I think it's important for this committee and for folks to realize what the impact of this undercount will mean to the the city of Detroit. Why we have to get this right. This. This certainly has significant implications. Could you uh, explain on the record for what, why we have to get this right? Well, uh, we've been cut already, $10 million a year nearly in state revenue sharing for police, fire, and other services in virtually every aspect of the federal government, from housing to hot lunch to, to Medicaid funding, uh, is driven by it. And here is, to me, the most interesting thing about uh, what we've seen. It, I, I've noticed with interest at the Pentagon has acknowledged the possibility of UFOs and is starting to study them. To me, the Census Bureau numbers in Detroit are even more remarkable. They've proven the existence of ghosts uh, because DTE has 280,000 housing units that are paying their light and gas bill, and the Census Bureau says we have fewer than 255,000 households. Uh, and so. Who's occupying these other 25,000 households paying the gas and light bills? Uh, and so there's two possibilities. We've either been uh, uh, invaded by a group of ghosts or the Census Bureau data is wrong. And, Senator, all I, I keep asking for is the same thing. If we can have an appeal process where we can bring in objective data like the University of Michigan report that you just entered into the record, no reasonable person will conclude that our number is correct. And here's the thing that aggravates me. Why are we a year and a half later? It's not that complicated. You write something that says, if you believe you're undercounted, here are the kinds of outside objective evidence uh, data points that you can present and we will consider them. Uh, and with the annual, the, the annual estimates now, there's even less defense. Here's what they do when they jump from 21 to 22. There's no privacy involved. They run a math calculation, birth rates, death rates, permits, how many people filed income taxes, how many people were on Medicare. Uh, it's a straight calculation. There is no way in the world 7,000 people left the city of Detroit in the last year. There is nothing secret about that calculation. Have them put the calculation out there and let us then objectively, I don't want any special treatment. All I want is to show you clearly and objectively what we have. But there's no urgency. If I were a banker, 
sitting in front of your committee with clear evidence that we had discriminated racially among the people that we were making loans to, you and Congress would be outraged and demand immediate action from the federal government. We are sitting here a year and a half later with people being discriminated against because of their color in the city of Detroit, and the Census Bureau hasn't even put out an appeal process. It's time we hold our own government to the same level of urgency to address racism that we would for any private company. I'm hoping that's what comes out of this hearing. Well, absolutely, Mayor. There's no question we have to get this right. And as you said, that's not special treatment. It's just being treated fairly. Make sure you count every individual uh, that's there. And, and in hard to count areas, these are folks who, uh, who need uh, to be counted uh, without question. And so, uh, as you know, we've been, we've been fighting this uh, for some time um, and believe, I certainly believe that state, local, tribal governments all need to have meaningful opportunities across the country to challenge uh, the census uh, where it's appropriate and where there's objective data to back up uh, their, their assertions. Uh, we pushed, I pushed uh, to create uh, some of these programs. In fact, one of, uh, so after my advocacy last year, the Bureau has created a, the post-census group quarters review program, uh, which does allow localities to submit new data for missing group uh, quarters like nursing homes, uh, colleges, uh, prisons. Uh, that uh, data is going to be part of the annual population estimates, as you know, and which is a basis for it's federal funding. Good step, the right direction. So we've taken that first step, but as you, like all good solutions, they usually require more than one step, uh, but it doesn't start until the first step. So we've started it with the, uh, the first step, uh, and we're uh, trying to push the Bureau to expand the population estimates challenge program to give you more opportunities to uh, have that input for the, the data. So my question for you, uh, Mayor, is is how has the city participated in the existing program to help with the undercount, including the uh, count question resolution program and this new uh, group quarters review program? And uh, do you believe that will provide some help for residents? Yeah, and, and I would defer to Professor Mornoff, who's more into that, but we have filed an appeal on that. We do believe that there are such clear mistakes on that we will get some relief from that, but it's actually only allows us to appeal uh, a small part uh, of the problem. And Professor Mornoff could probably describe the appeal better than I can. Yeah, uh, so the mayor is referring to the count question resolution program, which allows um, local entities to challenge the results of the decennial census, the 2020 census. And um, the problem is that the, the grounds on which you can mount those challenges are very narrow. Um, there's only really two types of challenges you can mount. One of them is what they call boundary issues. That's when you're contesting like the geography of where a certain housing unit was counted. And we thankfully didn't really have many of those uh, issues in Detroit. The other one are, are housing issues, and we did have a lot of those in Detroit. Um, and so the way to challenge the population count is through challenging the housing count. That's the way that the census sets it up. And that is what led to that extensive auditing of housing that we did. Um, uh, I worked with folks at the city to, to, uh, to help run that process, and we did an extensive uh, look at all the housing units on a set of blocks that we were challenging. So that process is now in, in, in operation. It's being reviewed by the census. But as the mayor points out, what's really important looking forward, in addition to the group quarters challenge, which is a critically important um, new addition to this process, and is also something that we are in the process of working on, and, we're, and, and we've actually, uh, through a lot of groundwork now, um, my colleagues have found like hundreds of people uh, living in group quarters beds that we think were, un were unaccounted for in the census, so that challenge is forthcoming. There's also going to be a challenge, we hope, to the population estimates program, but we need the census to reinstate that program and to also expand the way that it allows for challenges to occur, because there are some nuances to, to those rules that uh, that are frankly that, that kind of handcuff um, local governments um, like for one of them is called the county cap rule which is that if Detroit wants to challenge its population count the Census Bureau might adjust the population estimate but only in a way that the overall population for the county doesn't change so adding more people to Detroit would mean taking people away from the rest of Wayne County, and that is just patently um, not the way to go about this. It's absurd. Well, I'd like to expand, uh, if you would. Um, uh, you have these existing options that you're pursuing now, but specifically, what should the Census Bureau do right now to provide an opportunity for the city of Detroit and any, any other community in the state of Michigan 
uh, to uh, challenge uh, the, the count. What, what specifically? And this is about the mayor and to Dr. Marnoff both. We, we, we would like a very clear process that says, one, you can challenge the decennial uh, census, the 2020 census. Uh, we know we cannot project ourselves back in time, which is what makes uh, challenging census counts from April of 2020 so hard, but that we can present outside objective data. Uh, the director, uh, Director Santos, has already said the count was wrong. All I want is a chance to project, uh, to present objective data on what was right. Uh, and so it could be things like housing permits. It could be things like inspections. Uh, it could be things like the University of Michigan door-to-door -door study. It could be things like DTEs, records on electricity. What we would like the ability to do is say, here's what we think the accurate count is. Here's the objective. Data. And you can verify it. It's not us complaining. And then on the annual estimates, which in some ways may turn out to be more devastating to us because they affect our federal money every year, make the formula public and let us challenge that with objective data. That's all we want is transparency and the ability to present objective data. And Professor Mornoff can talk more about the data we want, but we don't want to do anything except objective, verifiable data to challenge these numbers. Yeah, I really don't have much to add to that. I think the mayor put it very succinctly. Uh, we, we do need better, more transparency and the ability to marshal the appropriate types of data that the Census Bureau will look at and, and match up to their data and, and really, you know, provide a fair comparison between what they counted and what we see as objective evidence of, of, of the number of people and the number of housing units in the city. And uh, I continue to work with the city to try to um, marshal as much of that administrative data as we can, things like building permits, demolition permits, um, we are, we're really trying to make sure, and I think every city, unfortunately, this, this process places a huge burden on cities to kind of do this on their own. And it would be helpful if the census shared more of its own data with cities um, so that, I mean, I, I, I've just been thoroughly impressed, but, but also astounded by how much time and effort the city has put into this process. Um, and, uh, and I don't know that many other cities have that same ability to mount this kind of a challenge. And that's not the way the system should work. It should be open for all cities to kind of examine the data and to challenge it if it's, if it's found to be inappropriate. So, Mr. Chairman, think about how easy this would be in simple terms. We do not want the Census Bureau to disclose the personal data of, of which houses were occupied. I think the pr protection of privacy is critical for future census count. But think about the Boston Edison neighborhood. 500 houses uh, in that neighborhood. The Census Bureau says 399 were occupied. The post office says 480 were occupied. Our door-to-door -door survey says 486. DTE probably says 470. What I would like to do is be able to hand the Census Bureau the DTE data house by house, which ones are occupied, the post office data house by house, which ones are occupied, and our door-to-door -door survey data house by house, which one is occupied. They can match that up against their own uh, census data, and they will see that houses they say are empty, the postman's delivering, the, the lights are on, and the door-to-door -door surveyors found people in there. That is going to be an occupied house. It wouldn't be that hard if we were to give that data to the Census Bureau for them to match it against their actual count and see where the undercounts are. What we're asking for is not complicated in today's world, but it requires them to have a willingness to do something they've never done, which is admit their count is not the most accurate and consider multiple objective verifiable sources from the outside. Certainly very reasonable. And uh, we will make that request, and, and I will be talking to the director, and we're going to be talking about what we have learned uh, at this hearing. We're, we're running out of time, so I, I just maybe throw out, and, and anybody can jump in um, on this, just some final thoughts that you would like to, uh, to leave uh, this committee with uh, and know that those thoughts will be delivered uh, to the Census Bureau and could possibly translate into legislation or other activities uh, that, are, that are taken. I'm going to start down, and you don't have to jump in if you don't like, but we'll start with... Uh, uh, Ms. Kuhn, because uh, I'm in the great city of Detroit, and uh, the mayor of Detroit always will get the last word uh, when I'm in the, the city of, uh, uh, of Detroit. 
Sure, um, just a couple last thoughts. Um, having had the opportunity to hear Census Director Robert Santos speak, we're encouraged by his approach and lived experience with the communities we work with. Also, we will encourage the Bureau to start early with ethnic communities and work with trusted allies already in community to better understand the people and their needs. We also support the Bureau having a sufficient budget to carry out its work as we've talked about here today. We'd also like to see the census revisit the race ethnicity categories to be more inclusive of identities that are not white. And I'm thinking more specifically of the MENA designation. And finally, we'd like to see more transparency on census tract completion rates for outreach purposes as we've talked about. Those are our final thoughts. Um, for me, um, the, what I would like to, uh, the final thoughts I would like to leave everybody with is really for this committee uh, to do with the elephant in the room, the, the importance of um, protecting the science mission of the um, Census Bureau and its independence from any political uh, interference is something that um, um, we need to pay attention to and we need to make sure we build the safeguards that will accomplish that. Uh, and of course, ensuring that there are adequate funding at all levels to allow the scientists to come up with uh, the, the tools that are needed to have a successful count and uh, to be able to invest in um, uh, uh, resources within the local communities that will ensure an accurate, an accurate count, especially in the communities that are uh, very hard uh, to reach. So these are the two areas that I would give everybody one. Senator, one of the things that I think would be really important to know is that the challenges uh, from the cities and urban cities like like Detroit well, has been challenged in the past. Uh, Coleman Young actually sued the Census Bureau and they did come back with uh, a more accurate count. I think they had lost like 50,000 and they were able to bring it back. And I just think so presidents have been set, even though it's, it's timely, costly. So if there's another way to do it by an appeal process that's opened, you know, beginning and end would be real important when we look at moving forward because we're, our, hampered with these numbers for 10 years and and you know even the estimates it doesn't have that much of an impact they can say estimates but it doesn't say census numbers so i think that that would be something at least that you as our senator could actually advocate that we have an appeal process because there's so many people that are unhappy with the count thank you mr anderson once again, uh, Senator, I want to say thank you for this opportunity to participate in this he hearing. Uh, I would add that the Urban League uh, would support, as the mayor has been talking about, and Professor Morehouse has been talking about, Morehouse, I'm sorry, to extend a broad flexibility in how you review local challenges to the 2020 census count. Um, it just seems logical and common sense that if the household count that they have is significantly different than the one that the uh, utilities have that you could make some adjustment and accountability. And the other uh, point I just want to make is one that I mentioned during the testimony that uh, states like Illinois, California, Colorado, and others have legislated, they have uh, ways of uh, allowing prison data, prison counts to enhance the local community count. Uh, in Michigan, that would require the state legislature to pass legislation that abolishes prison gerrymander. But I think that's something that as a community and a state, uh, particularly those of us in the city of Detroit, would want to advocate to happening uh, before the next census takes place. Thank you. Orna? Yes, thank you. Uh, first, I'm going to just underscore the points that the mayor ended his last comment with about ways that the Census Bureau could allow local governments like Detroit to just clearly bring data um, on each specific address in the city that it, where it feels that a challenge is necessary to line up against the census data. And one thing I, I neglected to emphasize in my prior comment is right now, 
we're allowed to bring data to challenge the existence of a housing structure, but we're not allowed to challenge the occupancy of that structure. And, and we also have data that, that speak to the occupancy and that data should be brought to bear um, to, to do that kind of comparison that the mayor was talking about. Um, also from a researcher perspective, uh, there are two things I just want to end with. Um, one of them is a point that Senator Peters already made, which is that uh, like the census conducts a very thorough post enumeration survey um, after the census is done to evaluate gaps in the coverage. Um, and it would be super helpful if those results could be made available at a more local level so we can see whether national trends uh, apply to Detroit and other local uh, entities throughout the country and how the errors in coverage might be different in those places. And then uh, finally, and this is a point that's made by the, the task force on census data quality at the National Academies, that the census, um, in part because of all the innovations it's introduced, has a lot more really nice operational metrics now of, uh, that, that allow researchers and evaluators to kind of dig deep into how the census is conducting its operations. And those measures should also be shared at a, at a, a local enough level that we can see things like how much of, of the non-response follow-up effort was happening in Detroit? Um, how, many, how many of these cases were being sent out to in-field address canvassing instead of just in-office address canvassing, which is happening behind a computer screen? But you know, how many people are actually going out into these neighborhoods? And how many of these cases are being resolved by resorting to proxy interviews, trying to find other people in the neighborhood to talk to about whether a given uh, housing unit was occupied on census day? Um, versus actually knocking on the doors and talking to the people directly. Um, these are all metrics that the Census Bureau is working on, but they have to be released at a, at a fine grain enough level for us to really understand what's happening in these local areas. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Chairman, I want to start by thanking you uh, for taking the time to hold this important hearing uh, locally so that the community uh, can participate. And I would just close by saying this. We have an administration in the White House that is committed to its core to racial justice. There's no question about that. We have leadership in the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House right now that have proven over and over again by their actions that they're committed to racial justice. We have leadership at the Census Bureau that doesn't seem to have any urgency to correct the racial inequities that are there. And it's my hope that what comes out of this hearing is that the values uh, that are uh, shared uh, by the Biden administration and by uh, you and your colleagues in the Senate and your colleagues in the House, that we put a spotlight on the Census Bureau and get some urgency and just give us a chance to present some facts and appeal. That's all I want. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And I, I want to thank uh, all of our witnesses. Thank you for, uh, for being here today. And for offering uh, your testimony. The, the information that you've provided uh, will certainly uh, put the local perspective uh, on the record as we address uh, challenges that the Census Bureau faces uh, today as, as well as in tomorrow and kind of better understand uh, the, the challenges that uh, communities across our state feel, but clearly here in Detroit uh, in particular, a significant challenge uh, that must be addressed. You're absolutely right, Mayor. This is something that must be addressed. Uh, and uh, the nice thing about what I've heard, uh, the way to address it is actually common sense. Uh, it's nice when you can put those two together. Uh, sometimes that can provide a challenge uh, for us to actually get it done, but clearly it is common sense. Uh, it is about making sure that uh, the data actually uh, is uh, accurate uh, and can be substantiated in an objective way, You're not asking for any special treatment, but making sure that everybody is indeed uh, counted. Uh, it is, uh, the census is only conducted every 10 years, but I think we can all agree that it impacts people's lives each and every year. This has a significant impact, as we talked about in my opening uh, comments. Uh, I'm going to continue as chairman of this uh, committee to uh, provide oversight of the Census Bureau and uh, leadership on the census uh, issues, and we're going to build on what we've learned uh, here today. I look forward to continuing to work with each and every uh, one of you, as well as the Census Bureau, so that we can address undercounts. Uh, improve uh, future census. This shouldn't happen in the future. Let's fix it and understand where the vulnerabilities are so we're not back at this uh, a few years from now dealing with uh, the same uh, the same issue uh, and make sure that uh, every Michigander gets the support uh, that they uh, they deserve. Uh, 
The record for this hearing will remain open for uh, 15 days until 5 p.m. on August 9th, 2022 for the submission of statements uh, and questions uh, for the record. Uh, this hearing is now adjourned.